All right, hi everybody. Uh, welcome to our seventh Globe Mission Earth webinar. Uh, I'm excited to have everybody here. We're going to do a recap of the surface temperature, which is now called Urban Heat Island slash surface temperature student research campaign. So the longer name that used to, used, to, used to be just student surface temperature. So anyway, we're going to talk about that, and I'll, I'll share my screen before we, so I think I forgot last time. Start off with uh, all the important stuff. This is part of Mission Earth. There's our, our partners. Always good to uh, talk about them. Boston University, West Ed, University of California, Berkeley, Tennessee State, NASA Wyoming. So tonight, these are our speakers. Myself, Susan Games from the Mohican School of the Outdoors. You may have gotten the name wrong, but so struck me. Uh, Matt Silverblick from uh, West Ed, and Jennifer Bourgeau, U.S. Country Coordinator. Uh, from New Hampshire. This is the outline for today. So we have the field campaign, kind of an update of where we are right now. And then Susan will be the teacher feature. Matt will talk about a rubric, and the NASA nugget will be uh, Jennifer. The reason we do all this is we want to get kids to do projects and present the projects. And, you know, I say this every time. You know, repetition is good, I suppose. And um, here's uh, Jennifer presenting her poster yesterday. So this is what we do at AGU, American Geophysical Unit. There's 25,000 scientists here in San Francisco. Um, you know, everything from planetary science, earth science, climate change, education outreach. And so Jennifer is presenting the GLOBE poster. This is Travis Anderson from the GLOBE Implementation Office. And then Peggy Folletta, uh, who's a teacher, a retired teacher from California. So we have opportunities for students to present their research. The virtual science fair is coming up. Uh, projects are due April 3rd. We have the regional science fairs, and I think Jennifer's going to talk more about those. Uh, don't forget the annual meeting in Connecticut, and it's important to bring students with you. We actually, uh, there were middle school students presenting yesterday here at AGU. I thought it was pretty impressive. Uh, they were presenting their project, their GLOBE students. They just started a GLOBE club. They weren't presenting their GLOBE work yet. Um, but there's actually opportunities for students to present at AGU too, which is really amazing. So we're going to talk about the Urban Heat Island Service Temperature Student Research Campaign, which is going on this month. And just some highlights, so far 42 schools have participated. Um, update today is there's 675 observations, and those are the countries listed, uh, are the ones that participated so far, Saudi Arabia, Trinidad and Tobago, Croatia, Switzerland, Taiwan, Japan, Sri Lanka, Spain, and Colombia, and of course the United States. There's many states in the United States. Huntington High School in West Virginia, they have the most observations with 202. That was as of yesterday, so there's uh, more than that. Um, there's some uh, we call chat, so if anybody has a question, uh, Jan, can you uh, like break in and ask me? So the extremes with the hottest temperature recorded so far was at Brazil High School in Trinidad and Tobago at 45 degrees Celsius. Obviously very hot, and the coldest was from South Dakota at negative 13. I actually think today there was a colder temperature from uh, Diana's class. Uh, most snow is at Crestwood High School in Michigan, so about 150 uh, millimeters, about 15 centimeters. Uh, here's a map of the schools that are, have participated so far since December 1st. I did this in ArcGIS Online, so I basically downloaded the observations from the GLOBE website and it easily pops into ArcGIS Online. I did change the size of the dot because they were a little small. All right, and here is some data from Croatia. 
Uh, I circled on the map uh, the country of Croatia. Right now, there's three schools have participated in the. You notice how their temperatures have kind of fluctuated. They're warm for a while, above 10 Celsius, and then they dropped to uh, below freezing, but not too cold, and then uh, came back up again. So they've kind of been, been, you know, cool and warm, cool and warm. They don't have any snow on the ground there, so um, at least at the, the school uh, that reported. I uh, got some of Diana's data here. Uh, just to show a little difference, so uh, Diana's kids were observing temperatures above freezing, and then uh, the bottom dropped out here. So it got pretty cold uh, today, and um, you know, it was the temperature. Air temperature was in the teens Fahrenheit, so the surface was even colder. So I made some maps. Here's December first, uh, showing uh, red, showing warmer temperatures. Along the equator, we have all the warm temperatures, so Trinidad and Tobago. Uh, the Spain observations are coming from an island. Uh, we have uh, Saudi Arabia, Sri Lanka, and Taiwan. So all these have warm temperatures. On December 1st, and you'll see the cooler, like the blue in Europe and the United States. And what I wanted to see was if there were any uh, urban heat islands uh, signatures in the data. So here's some data from around Lake Erie. Uh, this is the temperature in Celsius. And you see um, Diana's students at Crestwood, they observed one degree uh, Celsius. Uh, Jeff's kids at uh, Shimante Mill School observed 3.4. And then in Toledo, it was warmer. Uh, and then warmest yet in Cleveland. One of the, you know, there's, there's different reasons there could be cooler up in Michigan and warmer uh, in Ohio on December 1st, and probably could have been colder abduction coming in from the north. Um, there might be a little bit of urban heat island signature. You see how Cleveland is warmer than uh, Marcy's uh, school here at uh, Main Street, and then uh, Jeff's, no, sorry. Jim. Jim's observations at Lake High School of six degrees Celsius is warmer than University of Toledo with 8.9. So it might be a little bit of urban healing effect showing up here, but there's also the effects of high advection, polar advection. Uh, here's an observation from today, the observations. And one thing I noted was that in the Great Lakes, there's more purple dots. I forgot to put the legend on here, but uh, colder. Uh, obviously, colder weather coming in, and much colder coming in as a uh, snowstorm for Friday. It looks like we're going to have in the Great Lakes region, actually crossing the whole country, the United States. And so here are some observations from yesterday. And uh, again, I'm, this one not really seeing urban heat on effect, I think. Although, uh, see here, we have some temperatures above freezing. I did not separate out by cover type. So some of these could be grass, some of them pavement. So of course that's something you would want to do uh, if you're doing, uh, doing a research project. I didn't, I only had a few minutes to try to put together a graphic here. So uh, let's see, this is uh, in Monroe. I believe that's Waterloo Elementary School on the 13th, or it could be, sorry, I didn't uh, check. Um, Oh, there's another mill school there, sorry. And then Ida at the negative 7.7, .7, Ida Mill School. We have this value of negative 31 Celsius and at Lake Ice. I'm kind of concerned about that value, meaning it, it's probably too low. It's probably too cold there. So I'm wondering if the instrument batteries were getting affected. Uh, one thing I didn't know when I was at Ida uh, last week was when I left the value, the, the instruments outside, it was really cold out the batteries started to get affected. So I think the instruments, especially the cheaper infrared thermometers, might be uh, getting negatively affected by being on the site, but mainly because of the, uh, the batteries being affected. So, so one thing to try to do is to change the battery. All right, so why are we having all this cold air? And, uh, it's 
people call it the Siberian Express, and those of us who are old enough remember the Siberian Express from the 1970s. So that was the name of it. I, I was all excited. I was in school, and we got to miss school. It was really cold and windy and snowy. Um, so one of the things, we had early snow in Siberia. And what happens when you have early snow, high pressure, cold air, forms over the, the cold surface. And then the jet stream now is bringing the cold air directly over the pole through Canada and down to us in uh, the Great Lakes region. So here we have a snow cover. Basically, the northern half of the U.S. is covered with snow now. Uh, so there's nothing really to change the temperature except for in the Great Lakes. The Great Lakes themselves. So it would be much colder in Michigan and Ohio if we did not have Lake Michigan. So you'll notice temperatures in Wisconsin and even Illinois are going to be much colder uh, this next couple of days. I understand if your kids can't go outside to take observations, it's just too cold. Um, that does happen. Uh, some schools have a regulation. If a wind chill is below 15 degrees, I think, uh, you can't go outside. So some of the problems I've noticed with the data entry, uh, it seems like some of the schools, and actually a fair number, are putting in the wrong time. Uh, this was a problem when only universal time was allowed on the globe website. And um, when they allowed local time to be entered, that was supposed to solve the problem. But I think what's happening is the students are putting in local time but not clicking on local time. And it's uh, recording it as universal time in the database. Uh, another problem, at least one school has used Fahrenheit instead of Celsius. So that's important to use Celsius. Uh, some schools are rounding the values. There's one significant digit, you know, one decimal value on the uh, infrared thermometers, the tenths value, and that should be recorded. And lastly, uh, if you've observed values below 18, negative 18 degrees Celsius, uh, try changing batteries or not leaving IoT outside because uh, it might be negatively affected now. Of course, boy, uh, maybe tomorrow morning, I think it's going to be pretty cold. May have values in Michigan. And Ohio or below that. So that's something to just be aware of. It. Uh, when you start getting really cold temperatures, it's instruments are kind of messing up. All right, are there any questions about taking service temperature observations, clouds, or the field campaign in general? So open the floor up for questions. We have a lot of uh, traffic in the chat. So we had someone talking about how Lake Erie is warm, you know, keeping Cleveland warm, which is, which is quite correct, yes. Any questions from anyone? Oh, so Lynn is saying that in Montana, the low is predicted to be negative 31 degrees Celsius. Which is interesting. They have, uh, you probably haven't had that cold of weather in a long time, Lynn. Uh, uh, Rick Lawrence from Montana State, it's a few years ago to me, that the pine beetle infestation partly was caused by the fact that uh, the temperatures didn't get cold enough to kill the bugs. So when the temperatures get to this negative 30 degrees type temperatures, then uh, the pine beetle gets killed and, and uh, it, Cuts down the infestation. Oh, this is interesting. So Jeff pointed out that the students are keeping track of the soil temperatures. And I actually um, talked to Ida Mill School on Thursday, last Thursday. And we, we did do soil temperature along with the surface temperature. And to get the kids to understand that the warmth is still in the ground uh, from, from the summer. You know, it hasn't cooled down. The surface cools down first, and the further down you go, the warmer it gets. And so uh, that was interesting. I had to take a thing to poke a hole through the frozen ground or kind of a, a stake, but yeah, that was kind of neat to do that. I have 50 centimeter uh, thermometers I put in the soil, so those are kind of nice. So, so Jeff says the uh, first negative number is yes. That was Celsius, I assume, yeah. Right. 
So if there aren't any more questions, uh, let's turn the webinar over to Susan Gaines. She's at the Mohican School of the Outdoors, and Susan has been uh, part of GLOBE for a number of years, and she's helped schools in their uh, doing lots of projects. So, uh, Susan? Okay, so I am uh, going to switch things over here. Okay, so uh, my name is Susan James, and I'm the operations coordinator with Mohican School in the Out of Doors, and we're about two hours from, from Kevin and Toledo. We're in north central Ohio, and we're not your typical GLOBE program. Um, we're actually an environmental education program. I was explaining to Janet that we have a group of students from uh, Greenwich, Ohio, with us right now. They arrived yesterday and they will be with us until Friday around noon. And they will, believe it or not, be outside exploring the outdoors, learning about the outdoors tomorrow. Even though it will be very cold, we'll just bring them in and out. Uh, but I'd like to just kind of share with you some of the things that we're doing at the outdoor school, but even more importantly, uh, what we're doing with that, the student research campaign, the surface temperature campaign with a local school. So I've shown you some pictures here of some of the things that we do. We do soil studies and water studies. And just this year have started offering some professional development training for, to, to globe, train GLOBE teachers. Um, and we did our first training in October and have another one planned for this spring. Uh, our students are typically fifth or sixth grade. So I know a few of you were kind of wow about the, the middle school uh, concept and there's a lot that fifth and sixth grade students can do and do very well. Uh, you just have to be careful about how you're approaching that, and I think Marcy Burns would testify to that. Um, and as I said, you know, our, our program is usually three to five days, and we have a four-day session right now. What we're collecting at this time is uh, atmospheric data with a weather station uh, that's pictured here. Uh, we don't have perfectly uh, protocol fitting uh, settings in terms of you know where we have our equipment is where we know it will be safe from um, from visitors that might be exploring when nobody else is around to keep them out of things um, but we're collecting air temperature soil temperature barometric pressure and precipitation and we have been using globe protocols for our soil studies uh, ever since I started with globe in 2011 uh, even before I was trained in the GLOBE protocols, we were at least practicing using those. Um, we're really hopeful to, to get a SMAP site defined um, in the very near future and to define a hydrology site. Uh, we have about 130 acres that our students explore, so uh, just about every single protocol could be done at Mohican School. We just want to, to pick and choose carefully so that we can do it well. Um, and do things that fit very well with our customer. Uh, we currently have four staff members trained in the atmosphere protocols, and then my husband Steve and I um, are trained in all of the protocols, uh, in, in, or protocols in all four of those spheres. We've been working with St. Edward's School since 2012, specifically with that surface temperature campaign, which is now the Urban Heat Island campaign. Um, and we serve as a resource specialist to Kelly Reinman's students, sixth grade students. And we go to their school and provide um, support in defining the site and teaching the students the protocols. And uh, I'd like to share with you what we've been doing with them. They are currently collecting data for that campaign. Uh, St. Edward is a small private school in Ashland, Ohio. Uh, Kelly currently has 13 students this year, and what they have is a, a little park area that the students go out and collect surface temperature data uh, for that two weeks during the campaign time. Uh, and I've put boxes around those site areas. Uh, the students literally go out and uh, during the right around lunchtime, 
about 11.30. It works out perfectly with solar noon. And I've uh, got a few pictures of them actually collecting that data on their first day, uh, December 1st. Um, we generally have them before, about two to four weeks before the campaign starts. Even though we have those sites to find, we want to have the kids go through that experience of using that tape measure and seeing how that uh, site is defined with uh, uh, the size of it, and that way when they go to the website and look at how the data is uploaded, they can see how that applies to their particular site, why it's defined as a 15 meter by 15 meter instead of 30 by 30, uh, because they've actually measured it out. So the, one of the first things we teach the, the students there at uh, St. Edward is cloud types. Um, and we always chuckle with the kids because for about the, we usually go up on a Friday afternoon and when we go back the following week, everybody has done nothing but looking at clouds that entire weekend following. Um, and so this was uh, one of the teams of students looking at the sky, trying to figure out what kind of clouds we had on December 1st. It was a pretty cloudy day um, in Ashland anyways. Um, and it was a, a challenge to get everybody to agree on what kinds of clouds they had. Because the clouds looked dark, a few of them thought it, they were nimbus clouds. Um, so that's one of the things we have to always look for is to make sure there's consistency to some degree on what the, the kids are, are recording. And then um, working together to get those, those, those results on the paper correctly. Um, and so we, we always go up on the first collection day and then pop in uh, throughout that two weeks just to make sure things are going well. Um, one thing to note, you know, every training I've gone to when we're learning about clouds is that everybody tends to overestimate the cloud coverage and the kids are just like the adults. They always tend to overestimate that cloud coverage too. So that's one of the challenges. Uh, we don't get nearly as much face-to-face -face time as a formal ed teacher would get with these students, uh, but it's, it's every bit as rewarding, let me tell you. Um, and it's important to have multiple students collecting uh, data so that you get more of a consensus. Uh, so they always work in teams, and we have three teams that, uh, you know, each team is assigned to a specific site that they do each day, that they collect data for each day. Um, We've got a lot of successes, I mean, and, and it, it builds each year. Uh, the enthusiasm for doing some GLOBE uh, research projects and presenting at the, the Career um, Center, Penta Career Center in, in the spring. The, the student pictured here on the right is Simon, and Simon has become kind of our poster child um, for the success of the GLOBE program at, at St. Edward. When Simon started his GLOBE project, he really did not like science and wasn't exactly thrilled about going to their, their school's science fair. Um, but when he came to the GLOBE science fair and really felt like he had succeeded, uh, when he looked at his score and saw that how good of a score it was, that really, believe it or not, engaged him in uh, science. He, he thought, oh, I can do this to the point where he presented again at Penta the following year and then asked to use an infrared radiant, uh, radiant thermometer the following year as an eighth grader for his own science project of, of uh, I believe it was measuring the, the heat, the radiant heat through some t-shirts or uh, jerseys that they were going to purchase for their basketball team. He wanted to see how much heat actually was dissipated by those those shirts. So he's really, he, he describes himself as a science geek, as a, uh, he just really loves science now. And that's, to my mind, you know, that's what GLOBE really does. It engages students in doing meaningful science and um, really just learning how fun science can be. Um, it really serves as, as a great opportunity for the, the kids to work cooperatively uh, because they do have to take turns collecting data um, with using the IRT and then recording that data. And um, they, they just get so many opportunities uh, with going to the different science fairs to, to meet other students and see, see how other students are, are, are learning about science. 
So that's what we do. Um, you know, the, the non-formal education, but then also some outreach uh, with local schools. Uh, one of uh, another success just recently is that one of our participating schools with the outdoor school, New London Local Schools, actually became a Globe school this fall because of what we were doing with Globe at the outdoor school. And they are just very excited to be a Globe school now and start to collect some data. And that's what I have to, to, to say. Does anybody have any questions? That was great, Susan. I think I've lost you. Hold on. Well, um, we're here. Okay. <laughs> so we're here, yeah, I think. Uh, yeah, you did a great job. And, um, Jeff says uh, kudos to your science geek. Uh, I found it interesting that you have the kids define their site every year. And that's one thing I don't do. Even with my college students, I haven't had them define the site. But I'm wondering if I should. Cause that, I, I think when you're talking, it, it sounds like it ties the kids to their site. It gives them ownership. This is our site. Absolutely. And there's been times I've actually even used flags for them to, to put on the corners so that during that 10 days, they know positively where their site is. And then also, you know, for the elementary, early, middle school, measuring is still a challenge for some of those kids. And, and it just kind of reinforces the importance of being able to measure accurately. So Susan, you, you could unshare your screen. I, I'm trying to... It looks like my Zoom is gone. That's so. Uh, let me close out of this. Yeah, I'm going to literally get out of Zoom and and rejoin the the meeting. Okay. Spray paint to uh, mark the site. Okay. There we go. Um, there we go. Great. Super. And I thought that was a great example. You, know, you have the kids go out um, around solar noon. Uh, it depends on the school. I know Huntington High School, they have every class go out every day. It's pretty impressive. So that's why there's so many observations. They do multiple sites. Uh, right. That makes sense. Oh yeah. So we'll, we'll turn it off over to uh, Matt Silverblit, and uh, Matt's going to talk about uh, assessment and using tools. So Matt. Hey everybody, this is Matt. I've been working with Julia Malmberg, who's also on the call, on rubrics for what was last year the International Virtual Science Fair. We're now calling it the International Virtual Science Symposium. A little bit of a change in name there. A uh, little bit of background. Uh, so this is a place for students to share their research with other students. We have scientists who are our judges from the uh, Science Network, GISN, and, from the, and uh, broadly with the GLOBE community. So if you look, you can see last year's uh, projects on the web. You can see what students did. We had over 100 of them, so there's a lot of them there. Um, this year, it's going to be opened up a little more to undergraduates. Last year it was K-12, so now we're going K-16. And I'm going to share with you the rubrics that we're using so you can see how projects are evaluated. Uh, you can certainly use those rubrics in your classroom if they're helpful. There's lots of ways to use rubrics, both formatively and summatively. And also if you're planning on having students participate, um, it's helpful to have those rubrics in hand when you're getting started. Uh, so as I mentioned, we had over 100 projects last year from around the world. And uh, as I said, new this year, we're opening it up a little more. We have a new optional badge. I'm going to talk about badges in a little bit. And we had, uh, adjusted the due date. So a little bit later. Last year, we were trying to um, release the results on Earth Day. Um, this year we're gonna slide that back a little bit. 
Uh, so the, the overall project is given a badge based on uh, the students completing the project per the rubric. Students um, get credit for the criteria, meeting the criteria in the rubric, and then the judges assign at the end of scoring that project a uh, badge of one through four stars for the overall research badge. We also have um, optional badges that I'm gonna show you, and students can earn additional badges and those badges uh, don't have the stars, they either get them or they don't. Uh, and the nice thing about the optional badges is that students get to pick which things they wanna go for in those optional badges. And then new this year, last year, we just let students check a box to say, yes, I'm going for this badge. Um, it wasn't clear perhaps to some students that they needed to do something particularly uh, unique for that badge, and so we had some projects where they just clicked them all. So now we're going to ask students to really describe how that badge was earned in their report. So now there are six badges. Uh, last year we had five. The new one is the Exploring STEM Careers. So we're looking for students to pick badges that they want to be evaluated against. If they're doing a collaboration, uh, they can describe the collaboration in their report. If there's something in the local community that really inspired the project, something uh, like a local waterway and they were monitoring impacts on that waterway, that would be a community impact, for example. Um, if there was a collaboration, last year this was with a scientist, we wanted to open that up to clarify that's any STEM professional. Uh, a collaboration, there they can go for that badge. Uh, students might have uh, engaged in the engineering design process, that's a a more recent feature of um, science instruction now that's being promoted across the United States to have students engage in that engineering design process uh, in the context of their science. So we've added that. Uh, STEM careers, this is something that anyone can do. If you can think of a way that your project applies to a STEM career, you can describe that relationship. So that's uh, one that's really accessible to everybody. And then the last one is interscholastic connections. So we're looking for students to work with another school and uh, at least compare data at best. They're actually collaborating on a project plan that takes advantage of that collaboration. So this is for the overall badge. And there's a, a slightly different set of descriptors for each of the grade bands, but they're not that different. We're looking for, um, at the highest levels, that they've met all the criteria, which I'm gonna show you in just a little bit, that the report is well organized, uh, the writing is clear, that they've got um, at least uh, the elements that are required for acceptance in there. And uh, although it's not required, we are encouraging students to respond to judges' comments with, um, reflecting on those comments, how they've learned something from reviewing those comments and responding to them. Now, that's not required just because uh, we're not always sure that students are gonna be able to respond to those comments, and so that's just an encouragement. And then here's the descriptors for the badges, which I already went over for collaboration, community impact, connecting to a STEM professional, interscholastic connection, engineering solution, and exploring STEM careers. So students will pick one of these, and these descriptors, uh, I won't read them to you, but these descriptors should give students a better sense of how to go for those badges, and uh, we're gonna actually have another webinar for um, the virtual science fair in January to talk a little bit more in depth about badges. So I won't go into a lot of depth right now about badges. What I wanted to share with you are the criteria. This is a little bit different from last year. Last year, um, if you look at this rubric, for every uh, element of a project, and there are up to 12 at the highest levels, there were a set of things that you could score against. And this is um, pretty time consuming for judges. And sometimes, you know, when you're trying to build a rubric, you try to spread everything out so that you get the same number of categories for everything. And uh, 
as we were adjusting the criteria, we realized, well, you know, the criteria aren't all of the same weight. You know, having a title versus having an abstract versus having good research questions, um, they're not all the same weight. And so what we've decided to do is just give our judges the opportunity to evaluate the project as a whole. And so this, is, this part of the rubric is a little more holistic. And the criteria are just going to be a checkbox so that we can have uh, people just check off that the criteria are met. And that makes the job for the judges a little less time consuming, especially if we're um, hopefully getting the level of response or better uh, than last year. And as I said, the criteria adjust as we go down the grades. So we're going to start at the top with high school and undergrad. And these are the elements we're looking for. And I'm going to share with you, as you can see uh, at the end of the slideshow, a, a template that shows one way to organize these. But we're looking for um, these elements, not in any particular order. But the big picture here, and I want to emphasize this, is the training for the judges focuses on looking at how the report pulls everything together. So you might look at these um, criteria in the abstract and just check things off and say, okay, all these things are present. But really what we're interested in is, are the students doing good science? For example, are the research questions really answered? And this comes from an experience we had in looking at our regional science fair and seeing a, a definite distinction between projects where you could really see a clear connection between the research questions, the methods, the conclusions, et cetera. And others where the students started out with really broad research questions and then they did a couple of weeks of data collection in one particular site and what they were really answering was something very narrow, which is fine. There's nothing wrong with doing that in two weeks of data collection or even four days uh, could be enough for a project, but you need to make sure that the research questions match that, that scope of that project. And so that's really what we want judges to focus on uh, is the logic and the, the science behind all these criteria. So as we go down the list here, we're looking at uh, 6.8. So I'm just going to click back. So we're looking at a difference here in number four, um, asking for a little more rigor at the higher levels on that introduction. So that drops off for 6.8. Otherwise, 6.8 is almost identical. And then as we get into elementary, that's where we really um, reduce the expectations to um, match the grade. So we're looking at um, just a summary rather than an abstract. And then um, tightening up some of the, the workup of their results. So they're just focusing on writing a good conclusion. And then we're hoping we'll have some K2 projects this year. So we've really tried to narrow this down to make it something that um, the younger students can really do. And then we also wanted to uh, provide different opportunities for students to communicate. So some of the things that we've seen are posters, obviously, narr narrated PowerPoints are pretty popular, and then they can also have video. And so those things are posted on the website. If you look at the, at the GLOBE website for the science fair from last year, yeah, each of the reports has something that goes along with it, such as a video. And those are pretty fun to watch. Some of the students really had a lot of fun with those videos. Uh, there are lots of resources available to help students prepare for the science fair, or the science symposium, I should say. One of them is this poster template. So if you go online, this is a PowerPoint that you can replace uh, the text here. The text is just meant to be a placeholder. It's actually some of the descriptions of what, um, what we're looking for in the rubric so that they know what they're supposed to be doing. And then also we listed out the badges. And again, uh, students should be looking at replacing this text with a description of how their project 
addresses the badges that they selected. So Matt, is this on the global website? Yeah, this is in the resources um, for the Virtual Science Symposium. It's one of the, one of the resources that's available. Hey Kevin, uh, I just sorry, sent him in the chat room the link to the poster on the global you, website. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was just about to say, I don't have the link handy. <laughs> I got links to lots of things, that one wasn't one of them. Yeah, thank you Tracy. Yeah, and I should point out that this was something that was um, was created by Tracy for this, uh, for our, I believe, originally for our regional science fair, and now we, we found it very useful in sharing it out to the rest of the community. Uh, some of the other things that are on the on the website, these are other, the other resources, uh, getting connected to mentor scientists, a little bit about the process and creating research reports, good questions. Um, archives of webinars, and the reports themselves. And if you have suggestions for things you'd like to see, that's the what else. So do send us any suggestions you have. And then lastly, I'll just cover the timeline real quickly. Um, we're going to start accepting entries in 2017. You'll see an announcement. Projects are due uh, 3rd of April. And then we have a we have a little time where we organize all the projects and get them ready for the judges. Uh, the judges then score and post comments where students can respond and then we'll do the announcing on the 15th of May and a live drawing. Um, if you're not familiar with what we did last year, uh, we had a drawing for among the top projects, that is projects that earn the four star research badge and have attained at least two of the optional badges are eligible for the prize, which is uh, a, a voucher towards travel to the annual conference in Connecticut. And so last year we had four projects uh, where we invited teachers and students, um, any teacher or, or group of students can come, but these were the students who uh, received those awards, two from the US and two international. So we'll be looking to do a similar drawing this year. The uh, reason why we do a drawing, and I should have mentioned this earlier, is this is really meant to be a very merit-based approach. There's a bar that we're setting, and we want all students to feel like they have an opportunity to reach that highest level. And that's another reason why we changed the name from Science Fair to Science Symposium, because this really isn't about picking first place. Um, in many cases, it's really difficult to compare two projects that uh, have completely different objectives, completely different timelines. We've had students where um, the project maybe was going on for more than one year and others where the project took two weeks. And there's no reason why both of those projects can't be excellent and deserve recognition. So that's how we do it. Uh, we recognize all the projects that meet that highest level of achievement. And then from those we draw um, and we find that's pretty motivating to have that drawing. And as I mentioned, I did have um, a couple of links. You can go to the Science Symposium page here, or there's a pathway here. And uh, actually, I should have taken this off. It's not a future webinar. You can actually find the K4 project webinar. <laughs> Forgot to update the slide. The, the K4 webinar already happened, and it's uh, archived online. All right, so if anybody has any questions, I'll stay on for a little bit. So any questions for Matt? The dramatic pause. Well, I wanted to mention one other thing. There's a find a collaboration partner link on the GLOBE website where you can, uh, if you're interested in finding a collaboration, uh, you can certainly do that on your own, but one of the ways to do that is to, uh, is to go to this link, I'll post it in the chat. And there is a mechanism, I, I have only learned about this just today, so I can't really explain it, but there's a mechanism for finding uh, collaboration, getting collaboration started. We have a question from Jeff. He, he asked, how do teachers find the time to squeeze in the projects? Yeah, that is an excellent question. Thank you for that, because that's 
been a question we've been asked, and our answer is we don't want um, anybody to feel like this is an add-on. If you're doing GLOBE, everything that you need to participate in the science symposium are things that hopefully your students are already doing, and all we're asking the students to do is just to organize uh, what they've done into this particular format. And so if you have the rubric in front of you when you are start starting on the project, you have a good sense of what's expected to participate. But the project itself and most of the work that goes into it are things that you're already doing. And you don't, I don't want anybody to think that, oh, now I have to do an extra thing. It's what you're already doing and it's just a way of submitting and getting some recognition for the good work that you're already doing. And participating in an international uh, symposium, virtual symposium. Yeah, and I, I like to relate everything to soccer because I've been you know, coaching soccer now for a number of years. And it, it dawned on me just now that the idea of having the kids present at the virtual science symposium, then present again at the Midwest Science Symposium or uh, the other regional ones that Jen will talk about, I think, in a minute. And then uh, maybe at their local science fair. So multiple... Uh, presentations make sense to me because you know the kids can present, get feedback, uh, modify their project, you know, present again. It reminds me of like you know when you play a sport, you don't just play one game, right? You don't practice the whole year to play one game. You, you, you it's a process of getting better. You get better by doing. So uh, anyway, that's my takeaway tonight. All right, so uh, Jen uh, is going to talk about the symposiums. Jen, are you ready? I don't hear Jen yet. I see her frozen picture too. She's muted. Oh, wait, something's happening. Maybe it's her. Okay, can you hear me? Yes. yes. Yay. <laughs> All right, sorry about that. Okay, hi everybody, good evening. I'm always last, I think. I hope you can see my screen, yes? We plan it that you're last, uh, sorry. I know, yes. Okay. End with a bang. <laughs> my name is Jennifer Borjo, and I am the United States Country Coordinator. I am also the New Hampshire GLOBE Partnership Coordinator, and I've been with GLOBE for a long time. Um, but the most exciting thing that probably has ever happened to me was when we started and were funded by an NSF grant to fund six regional student research symposia. And as Matt said, they used to be called science fairs. Ours were also called science fairs. And we did change the name for the same reason. And uh, after last year, we really wanted to focus on student sharing data, just like uh, scientists would do at a student at a conference. These uh, six symposia are for teachers and students, and we have our grade levels at five to eight and nine to twelve. Students that would like to study their environment and discuss the research with other students. We also wanted the, the grant funding, funded webinars and blogs by teachers, uh, supporting integrating the field investigations into classrooms. And we did that through these web, a series of webinars and also helping to connect GLOW partners with the students and teachers, or students and teachers with local scientists to help mentor. The original grant proposal, the funding was first and foremost for teachers and students who had not already participated in 
things like the Globe Learning Expedition, uh, submitted to the virtual science fair before, um, who don't compete in Intel science fairs, state science fairs, science Olympiads, all of those things. So we really wanted to go for uh, at least direct our funding primarily for teachers and students who had not done this. The agendas were very similar across the regions. They added their own regional flair uh, with the first day arriving and setting up the poster and doing a group activity. Uh, at the Midwest one, they did a scavenger hunt at, uh, actually two of them had scavenger hunts with GPSs. We did uh, night sky viewing with telescopes at NASA, which was, you know, pretty cool. Uh, we had keynote speakers at other ones. So we did lots of different things depending on the expertise of the GLOBE partnerships that we're sponsoring. The second day was this poster rotation and uh, talking to the judges. And I say that in quotes because this year it won't be so much judging but having this peer review opportunity, this chance to talk to each other about what their questions were and what they found and where they might go next. We also had activities for the students. Some of the uh, symposia had uh, really focused on the career and how the scientists got to where they are with, uh, when they were having those uh, judging. And other ones, they had activities for students to do. We had kite flying. Um, students were at a museum in Mississippi, so they had time to see that. We had backstage tours of some of the NASA centers we were at. So it really, again, depended on where we were and the background of the leadership. Globe Partners also had a meeting. And then we also used that as an opportunity to provide some professional development for teachers. Uh, all at the same time. So it was an action-packed day and a half. Uh, and then we would have awards, evaluation, and closing. The timeline, how it's shaping up this year, I do have dates in there for the International Virtual Science Symposium. Uh, in those dates we took from the website. There are so far four regional symposiums scheduled. And you'll see that they start April 27th, and the last date is June 2nd, and that's the Pacific one at Jet Propulsion Lab. There's two that are very close to being scheduled. We're gonna try and get those uh, in the books, date confirmed in the next couple weeks. So you can watch the website, and I'm gonna tell you where that is in a minute. In terms of the teacher commitment, so we do have funding to support teachers and students coming. And what we do ask is that um, teachers to fill out a short Google form and that Google form is on our website. And we'd like teachers to talk about how they're gonna implement it in the classroom. Because it is, it is a commitment to do this. As Jeff had said, how do people do that? And we want to make sure we know up front what the challenges are so that we can make sure we're helping teachers as much as possible to get this into the classroom and to have uh, good preparation so that everybody feels confident when they show up and put up their poster. So that's what we're going for. We're also hoping that once this has started and your students are doing this, they want to submit to other uh, science fairs or ways to just uh, present their research. And once we get teachers started, we'd really like to expand the network. So um, what can happen afterwards? And that's really what that Google form uh, identifies. We already did these webinars on uh, different topics. And what we're hoping for this year is instead of redoing the webinars, which are already um, nicely organized, they have a lot of resources with them, what we want to do is have open office hours 
And that means that we would have an hour and a half starting January 5th where teachers and and potentially students and partners can just check in for a few minutes, ask some questions that they're having about that particular topic or anything, and we would be able to answer those in those time periods. So it's really, it's a, a way to support the entire development of this idea nationally. And here's the timeline for that. They would all take place from 3.30 to 5 uh, Eastern time. And we tried to find the best time when teachers may be in school but may be able to find a few minutes. And remember, we're dealing with several time zones from Alaska and Hawaii all the way over to the East Coast. So we really wanted to try and find times that would work for everybody, but there's um, just time zone issues. The five topics, first we have a question and answer period, and then we have these five topics. The conducting field investigations one, the webinar for that is great. It's done by Pat Otto, and it is one of the most highly viewed webinars that we have. There is a free downloadable book that you can uh, get from their website, and those links are there. There's also an updated book that really highlights the NGSS connections, and I highly recommend her resource. We'll be updating the uh, links for that so that you have the most current book. It wasn't out uh, until a few months ago. The other one that's a great one that I, the writing conclusions using the CER framework, that one is also highly recommended by teachers. And the last one, putting it all together, the poster, I, I heard rumors that students watched that one and took notes before they did their poster. There's two other additions this year. First of all, we tried to do teacher blogs last year. Uh, we were in a time crunch. We pulled this off in eight months. This year, what we'd really like to do is encourage teachers as you're going through these five steps with your students to talk about how it's going in the classroom, your successes and failures, and we really would like to highlight teacher practice. What's happening in your classroom with these? So uh, there is a small stipend available if you would like to write a blog post for us. And we, you have that capability through the GLOBE site, and you can contact me through that email, and we would be happy to have you uh, write a blog. The other part of that is student videos. We would like to create videos for students made by students on those same five topics, webinars that are five to 10 minute videos, that we can post on a, the YouTube channel and show off how students have been doing this and what challenges they have, what they learned, what are things that they had to think about when they were designing the research question, what happened when they went to do the analysis, any kind of topic like that. So you would upload it to a YouTube channel or TeacherTube or however you do that normally. And we would like to share that through these uh, regional symposia. Uh, we are going to need a video permission slips, and those are on the GLOBE website. We can just send you those links. And my final slide is more information. The first two websites, they're not clickable, probably. So uh, I just wanted to say that you can also go to the GLOBE US overview page, and there is a link to the Student Research Symposia webpage. And then also you can see that uh, on the left-hand side, there's a picture of me and you can click on that and that's how you can get to my blog. So look for the US page if you don't wanna memorize these particular links. And that's all I have. And if anybody has any questions, I haven't been able to look at uh, the chat. Oh, but there's like 10 of them. <laughs> uh, we've been um, discussing ice on the Maumee River in the cold weather, so. Uh, okay, so there's nothing for me in there. 
No, it was like a side discussion, but uh, fine. Anyway, thank, thanks, Jen. Any questions for Jennifer? So April 3rd is the last day to submit for the uh, virtual science fair. Aileen is going, bye Aileen. All right, so, um, so Jan, if you stop sharing your screen. Oh, I'll sorry. Wrap it up. Is the teacher blog open to international partners? And that's what Femi uh, wrote. And by the way, everybody, if you don't know Femi, uh, he's a great guy to meet. He's from Nigeria, and it is currently 3 a.m. in Nigeria. So uh, he's staying up late to uh, be on with us. Um, you know, maybe next time we should get Femi to do a, a little uh, presentation. So are you still sharing, Jen? Uh, no. Oh, yeah. You, that's just your, your, uh, your frozen picture. Oh, I got a picture here. Uh, Lake effect snow and buffalo. Just keep an eye on that. All right, so to wrap up our webinar here, I'll talk. Just mention our next webinar. Let's see, here we are. So our next one will be in January. Now I encourage you to uh, attend Jennifer's webinars because she's you know got she's going to go into a lot more depth in, in the um, you know doing your projects. And so we'll be sharing that with everybody and you know, getting it out to the community. Uh, on January 25th, our webinar, we're going to feature Ellen Perkins. She's a kindergarten teacher. She's going to talk about her students. And we're going to have a focus a lot on uh, the elementary globe. And so Jessica Taylor from NASA Langley is going to talk about the Elementary Globe Climate Change book, uh, which is a really nice book. Oops, got some extra there. And uh, so always, you can find us on Facebook. Uh, Janet posts the uh, webinars on our YouTube page, which is Globe Mission Earth. Stop sharing. Okay. Any uh, 22 Celsius in Nigeria. So if I'm just rubbing it in, it seems nice there. Any last uh, comments by anybody? All right, well, thanks everyone for calling in and uh, participating. Uh, thanks to all the uh, speakers tonight. They did a wonderful job, uh, Susan, Matt, and Jennifer. And uh, yes, yeah, well, stay warm. And uh, uh, some of us are going to enjoy the rest of the AG meeting. So uh, we'll fly the global flag at the meeting. Hi, everybody.